I love that bass drum at the end of that video. It, it gets you like, it feels like we're at a football game. It's pumping there. But today we're continuing our sermon series called Identity Crisis. And this series is all about knowing who we are in Jesus Christ. So we have a theme verse. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. And can we say it together this morning? We won't sing it together because you wouldn't like my voice. But can we say it together as we start? It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... I, I'm so sorry. Let's try that again. I did not count that down. That was my bad. You know, I don't have the rhythmic timing that we also want. Uh, in three, two, one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Thank you for humoring me. We've got that together. We're going to keep it nice and tight. But in this verse, we are told we have a brand new identity. And that gives us a brand new perspective on life. We start seeing how God is working, how God's moving, and how kind of God starts rearranging our lives. And when God is arranging our lives, it changes everything. It gives us this brand new viewpoint on how things will work out. And today we have a theme verse, kind of a theme idea. It's that I am assured that God works everything for my good in all circumstances. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I love that Bible verse. It's so positive, it's uplifting, it's kind of like K-love. If we had like a list of top 20 most encouraging Bible verses, that's maybe top 10. It, it's up there. It's like John 3.16, Jesus loves you. You know, it, it's such a positive, happy verse. I would also list it on my top 20 most confusing Bible verses. Because if there's a verse that's kind of hard or difficult to understand at times, I think that's it. Because we hear this verse quoted when things happen, when something big occurs, and I wonder, huh, how does that work out? Like, we hear this verse quoted when somebody wins the Super Bowl, and, you know, I love hearing people talk about their faith in public. I think that's awesome. It's such a great example. But I always look, I'm like, well, why can't I win the Super Bowl? And then, uh, you know, I look at myself in the mirror. I'm five foot ten, like, average guy. I'm not, I'm not competing in this. Or we hear this after, like, somebody creates a great invention and wins the Nobel Prize, and I wonder, why couldn't I do that? And then I re remember, I'm afraid of electricity, and I think I'm going to shock myself if I touch anything on there. Or I, we hear it after somebody finishes a marathon for a super emotional reason, commemorating somebody in the past, and I wonder, why can't I do that? And then I stop questioning that. I hate running and everything about that. It's a terrible thing to do. People quote this verse to be inspirational. But if we think for a moment, this verse has to be more than just like this positive outlook on life, right? Because we look around, we kind of check out the situations all around us, and we say, can God really use that over there for my good? Can this right here really be turned for good? Or there is so much evil, there are so many problems in the world, just look at the newspaper. Can all of this work out? But we are told by God right here and right now that he will work all things for the good of those who love him. That there is this sort of like cosmic, massive redemption where even the wrong things can be turned out for good. And it reminds me of my favorite redemption story, a story 300 years in the making. It's a story of penguins and landmines. Now, I'm a huge fan of penguins. This is my stuffed penguin. His name is Stan. Uh, this is not my son's penguin. This is my penguin. I've had him for 10 years. I want to clarify that. Seth does not get to play with this. This is a uh, decoration in my office. But there is something special about penguins. I just, I love them. They're cute. I watched a documentary where they were in the other day. It was really, it's exciting. But this story is a story of redemption. I want to set the scene for you. It goes back to the 1700s in a place called the Falkland Islands, which is off the coast of Argentina. Uh, we have a map here. There it is. It's a little island right there. Uh, geography is not a, the strong subject for Americans. Uh, thank you, school systems. Uh, but, you know, we're, so we've got a map today. But as we go through this, we find out in the 1700s, there's about 10 million penguins in this joyous set of islands. And then something terrible happens. People from Europe start coming over, and they start hunting whales nearby. And that causes a problem because they want the whale oil that comes from whales. They get it from whale blubber. So they land on the Falkland Islands to try to process the whales that they hunt. There's a ton of them around there. But the Falklands lack something important. They don't really have a lot of trees. It's kind of like a, a gritty desert-like environment. There's not, it's not big on foliage. So the whalers have an issue. How do we boil the whale blubber to get the whale oil? And in some horrific 
world, they find out that penguins are highly flammable and can be essentially substituted for wood. The penguins were used to make whale oil. It, it, it's horrifying. And in the period of 150 years, the penguin population drops from 10 million to a couple hundred thousand. The only things that saves them is the fact that all of a sudden, the whalers stop catching whales because we don't use whale oil anymore. The penguins are, it's a bad day for the penguins. Fast forward another 150 years. It's the years of the 1980s. And there's this unusual thing that happens. You see, Argentina and Great Britain have contested these islands for the last 150 years or so. There's this whole question of who actually owns this. And out of nowhere, the Argentinians invade. They kick the British off the islands, and they're gone. They know the British are coming back. Margaret Thatcher is the prime minister of England. She's a feisty lady. So she says, we're going back. We're going to retake these islands. In the meantime, the Argentinians lay down landmines, preparing to stop the British. The British come back, wipe out the Argentinians. They just go right around the landmines. And then the British are left with this problem. What do we do with all these landmines on the beach? We know landmines are terrible. They hurt lives there. It's an absolute catastrophe. So they decide, we're going to put up some fences, some ropes, put a sign, danger, landmines, and walk away. And in this moment, it looks like everything is ruined, that there is something absolutely evil that's going to cause problems for years to come. Except something different happens. We find out redemption happens for the penguins. Because the penguins have two natural enemies in life when they're on land. Cattle, which eat their breeding grounds, and also human beings who want to play with the penguins and ruin their lives. All of a sudden, we see that the penguins are able to walk on top of this landmine field, no problem, but everything that tries to come at them to bother them has a major issue. All of a sudden, we see scenarios like this, where the penguins are being celebrated, danger, landmines, their life has improved. They jumped millions in populations all of a sudden. What was evil turned out to be used for their good. That in this crazy way, there started to be this sword of redemption where the things that were designed to destroy lives started to be used for good. And while God's plan is way better than, bigger than a penguin, it is this start of a taste of redemption that God is working out, that he is redeeming evil for good. That God is able to take the landmines, the issues that are deeply embedded, the things that are, we struggle with, the things that could destroy us, and start using them for our good to bring life out of death. Because God has this crazy ability to repurpose our past and use it for good. And I think we want that. We want to know somehow that the things that we are going through, all the good things, all the bad things, all the things that are in between can be turned out for our good. And not just in this naive, optimistic way either, but in a way where we could expect God to work. We want to know that the struggles of school, the crazy teachers, the pointless assignments, that they're going to pay off. We want to know the challenges of raising our kids, that they're worth it, that the scenarios that they get themselves into that we don't understand, that it's going to be okay, that it's not in vain. We want to know that there is life at the end of a dark tunnel. We actually want to trust that God's got this. And today, we're going to be talking about one of the most challenging, the most important things to know, that God works for our good in all circumstances. So we're going to be looking at the book of Romans today, and Romans is written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, whom he had not yet met. So as he's writing this letter, he's kind of just spouting his theology. He's giving the idea of, this is what I believe, this is what I want to come and teach in your church, and he's also hinting that they should fund his missions trip to Spain once he gets there. And about halfway through the letter, he starts writing about this huge section of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. What it's like to experience a spirit-filled life. And here, Paul gets to a big point. He starts talking about the future. Specifically, the future glory of what God is going to do in the life of believers. Paul starts talking about this massive cosmic redemption where God sets the world right and what that means for us right here, right now and also in the future. Let's dive in today. We're going to start in verse 18. It says this. So Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. 
Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope we are saved. For hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So Paul starts off this passage right here by saying something very bold. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul is establishing some reality here and then giving us a bigger picture. Because Paul is doing this thing where he is clear, honest, and kind of obvious. Paul says right here, right now, we have struggles. Everyone suffers in some way, in some shape, or form over their life. Paul is just being honest. He is telling the people, following Jesus does not remove you from reality. It's not this get out of pain free card. It's not a guarantee that your life is filled with hugs and skipping through the meadow with friends. Paul is letting people know, Jesus knows your pain. He knows your suffering, but we're in it. You are locked into a world that is broken and that is in need of healing. But then Paul gives hope. He follows it up after that encouraging message and says, yes, we have issues right now, but our future with God is beyond comparison with our present issues. That the future that God is creating for us is so much greater than anything that we are going through right now. And it leads us to our first point today, and it's that God gives great hope. Because Paul is clear in this passage, we have something to look forward to. We have a God who gives great hope to his people. And biblically, hope means this. It embraces expectation, trust, and patient waiting. Hope is all about patient endurance. Looking ahead to what God has called us to. And God has called us to great things. There is everything to be excited about for the future where God is in control. We are filled with this hope because God has made real promises and he is in control of our lives. But you've got to read the subtext here. We are waiting. You only hope because you have something you're waiting for. And Paul tells us right here, right now, we are waiting. We need to wait patiently, enduring what is happening in the world, because the future with God is better than anything occurring in the present. In fact, Paul tells us all creation has been waiting for God to redeem it. Nature is literally groaning. It is waiting. It is saying, God, is it time? Is it time yet? Is it time? It is waiting to be redeemed. We find out that we are waiting to be redeemed. We might not always know it. We might not always experience it. But our bodies and lives, they are waiting for God to come into that and change us, to bring us to be part of his family. We have hope, but we are waiting. And waiting is not easy. Now, I'm an American. It's pretty obvious by just how I look at sometimes. You know, it's, I have the American attitude. And one thing about that is I hate waiting. In every circumstance, I hate it. Everything about the concept of waiting repulses me. One of the greatest lies that I tell everyone, and I want to apologize in advance for the times I've lied to you, is take your time. <laughs> I've never said it and meant it. I, I, hate, I hate waiting. It's, it's my sign of I'm trying, but I'm failing. I hate it. I hate waiting in lines, too. There's a line I will do everything I can to avoid that line. I love grocery shopping. I go to the grocery store, but I get to that end, and I evaluate the scenarios that are going on pretty harshly. I worked at a Wegmans for nine years, so I'm all about knowing who's taking care of me in this moment. I want a cashier, for the record, with a real name tag. If they have a make it your own, it means they were just hired. They don't know the produce codes. They are going to slow you down. <laughs> it's real. It's how you judge it. But it's not just about the cashier, too, because obviously you want them moving quick. But you also got to look at the person in front of you. They're a problem. How are they paying? <laughs> they are. How are they paying? Is it a check? Is it cash? Not from me. That is going to slow this process down. Lots of room for error here. I want credit card, Apple Pay, or however you pay on an Android phone. I'm not in that world. And above all, you know you got to help bag. You might say, that's their job. No, 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 no. It's my job too because I double team this scenario. I'm getting out. I'm getting my life back. Get me out of this store. I hate the waiting process. But I think we all hate it. We hate waiting. And for good reasons, right? 
Because more than most of life isn't spent waiting in grocery stores. We're waiting for things that are more difficult. Maybe you're waiting for the end of school. You know, it's difficult. It's not your thing. You've got a couple years left, and you just want to be done. You know that it's valuable. It's important. You're not trying to get out of it. You just you want to be done, but you're waiting. Or maybe you're waiting for that big promotion at work. Year after year, you work hard. You're faithful. You do all the right things, but for somehow, some reason, it's not coming. You're overlooked. No idea why, and it bothers you, but you're waiting. Or maybe you're here, and you're waiting for your children to return to God. You're praying for them. You have did the right thing. You have good relationships with them, but you're waiting. You're praying for them, but you're waiting. And it's not easy to wait. It wears you down. And it actually frustrates us because waiting gives us this feeling that things should be better than what they are, but for some reason, they're not. There's a discontent with waiting. Things should be better, but they're not. And I think that's actually a sign from God because this discontent is a reminder that we are not complete We are not fulfilled until we trust in God and his plan of redemption for the world. And today, if you're here and you're exploring who Jesus is, you're at a crossroads of faith, wondering why things aren't better. You might wonder, with how bad things are, how could there be this God? And I want to tell you that's actually a sign that God exists and is trying to get your intention. Because if there was no God, there is no reason why anything should be better. It's nothing but random chaos. Without God, there is no end game. There is no goal for the world to strive to. It's all pure chance. But we have a discontent built deep into our lives because God is letting us know the world is not able to fulfill us. Our hope and our longing is for something better, a better ending. And this sign is deeply imprinted on our hearts because there is a God who has a plan to redeem the world and fulfill our hearts. There is more to our lives than these current circumstances. God is calling us to something more, a redemption-filled life. And Paul tells, the whole world, tells us the whole world is groaning for that. It is waiting. And in the process of waiting, God uses this expectation that things should be better to draw our attention to our needs, our deficits, and more importantly, point out that hope is found in God alone. Because we don't wait in vain, we wait because God gives hope. We wait because there is hope. And Paul is super clear about this in his letter to the Romans. We are not waiting for a mediocre hope. We are waiting for nothing less than God to redeem the entire universe from sin. We are waiting for the very real day where we will not need to pray, but we will will not need to hope, but when we will be in the presence of God day and night, night and day. And while we are in this spirit of waiting, the Holy Spirit is working alongside of us and inside of us to strengthen us so that we can patiently endure until our hope is fulfilled. Because our hope is worth waiting for. There are, after all, few things better in life when your hope becomes a reality. Now, I told you um, a few months ago that my son was getting ready to stand and walk. And, you know, it was very exciting times in the Yaros household when all this happening. And Seth was getting into his position. And partially, I wanted to reiterate this because it's fun to crawl on stage. But, you know, he would start down here, roll over, squat, line man, stand. Now, the standing was, used to be very nerve-wracking. Now that's old school. Anybody could stand. It's not a big deal at all. But he is getting ready to walk. And I am so excited because my hope is that he could walk so soon. And I see him walking along the rail in his like playpen area. I've seen him take a few steps here and there. But I'm waiting for the day where he will just walk. Straight forward, not looking for something else, just walking. And somebody said that they've seen it. I don't believe it because I wasn't there. It only is real if I'm there. Because I am waiting. And I'm hoping. And I know it's coming. And I can almost taste it. It's almost there. But I'm waiting. But I know my hope is going to be coming true so soon. But I'm waiting. And I'm still waiting, but I'm waiting with hope because we are called by God to hope. And that means sometimes we wait. We wait with patient endurance. We wait with great anticipation for what God is doing because God is worth the wait. We wait because Jesus gives us a hope that our present sufferings, our present challenges are not compared to the insurmountable glory of what God will do in the future. So what do we do in this situation? We have great hope but we're waiting. Well, it leads us to our second point today, and it's simply that God is working. Because while we are hoping, while we are waiting with eager expectation, we could rest assured that God 
is working. And his answer might not come today. It might not come tomorrow, but it is coming because God is working. So now we finally get to our key verse. It's been a lot of buildup towards this. We're just setting the stage. It's a great verse. But taking the first part of Romans 8.28, it says this. And we know that God works, and that in all things, God works. So we're taking this slow today. In fact, we're just getting into the first half of that verse. Why? Well, we covered the 10 verses right before this because it's important to know the context of what we're reading. Sometimes if we read like Bible verses in isolation, we get kind of a weird message. It's not that the Bible is weird. It's that we're just taking one piece out of something that has so much more to say about a big topic, and we don't get the full context of what's going on. We kind of get this because we want the context in every other area of our life. So we also want to do it with the Bible. Because when we get to this verse, we want to get the idea of what God is leading us to. And I have an example to make that a little more clear of what I mean. Can we throw in that text message? So I want to talk to you about a text message conversation. This is purely fictitious. But it's setting the tone of why context is important. It starts off with what I'm imagining a young man asking out a young lady. He says, can I take you out for coffee? And the person responds, hi, I love coffee. And I would imagine right there, if we were just reading those two lines, they're in love. This is going to work out. I hear wedding bells, coffee-themed wedding. It's all going to be great. But then we get to the next line, and all of a sudden, context changes. But my mom has the car. Okay, maybe there's a challenge in this early relationship. This could still be overcome. He should be a gentleman anyway and pick her up. So this, everything's okay still. Then a third line comes in. Also, I might have the flu. Huh, context clues are kind of telling us right here, maybe there's an issue brewing. Maybe this person doesn't want to go on the date. Let's see what else we find out from this relationship. And I have to wash my hair. My wife told me that she loved that uh, and that she thought it was the best part because you could do that anytime. This person is throwing any excuse out in the world right now. And then we get to the final round on this. Also, if you were the last person in the world, I wouldn't get coffee with you. My answer is, hit that last part here, no. And then there's also the last dig that we get at this. But if you could door dash it to my house, that'd be great. Thanks. Bye. The context clues of this say there's a lot to know. That poor guy is being rejected. And also, apparently, the girl that he's kind of going after is really not that nice either. You could be let down a person in a much nicer way. Context is important. If we don't know everything that's going on in a verse, the things right before and the things right after it, sometimes we read verses like this and we think that God is just like promising us good thing after good thing, that life is filled with Chick-fil-A milkshakes and zero weight gain. I mean, that's the dream. Don't get me wrong, but that's not what Paul's saying. Because Paul is telling us right here, in the middle of deeply spiritual challenges, in the great wait for God to redeem the world, God is still actively working in all things. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works. And our hope is that God works in all things. And that's the difficult part. The all things part. Because when you live life long enough, and if you're here and you haven't had a challenge yet, I want to prepare you emotionally for that. Usually it's a younger person. We will all face challenges. We will all face issues. We shouldn't lose our faith in them. We should be prepared for them. If you've lived life long enough, you know that not all things are good. In fact, you find out some things are distinctly evil. Some things are bad. Some things are terrible. Your spouse leaves you, breaks your heart, leaves you in a terrible place financially with kids not knowing what you're doing next. Your business that you've worked for for years has layoffs, and you went from a man with a plan wondering how you, now wondering how you're going to pay for your mortgage. Or maybe you were ready for that last season of sports in high school or college only to find out that you're robbed because of an injury. None of those things are good. Some of them, in fact, are distinctly evil. How can we believe that God is working in all those things? Well, first, there's a clarifying point. God never calls evil things good. Sometimes when we hear verses like this, if we don't dive into it enough, we hear verses like this in the Bible and we start thinking, God is calling something distinctly bad good? The answer is no. The bad circumstances we face, the evil things that happen to us, are not called good by God. We live in an absolutely broken, fallen world, but God does not pretend that bad things are good. God does not will that evil things happen to you. John Lindell, a pastor at James River Church, wrote about this in his book called Soul Set Free. He says, this does not mean God directly scripts every hardship in your life. 
Rather, it is the very nature and character of God to always be at work bringing beauty out of the brokenness in your life. What we discover with Paul here in all of this is that we are in this waiting time. And while we are waiting, God is working. And in all things, God is beginning to move. Because the word that Paul uses here is synergio in Greek. And it means to conspire actively to result. Essentially, Paul is writing that God is taking every corner of your life, every circumstance, every situation, and beginning to actively participate in them. God is working on using the circumstances and situations from every nook and cranny of your life. He is piecing them together through the Holy Spirit and starting to connect the disconnected areas of our lives to lead us to this new end product. The process of God working in our lives brings together our entire being. And it's almost like God takes this massive inventory of every part of our life, every interaction, every painfully awkward moment as a teenager, and for some of us still in adulthood. God takes every failure, every victory. God looks at all of these things and begins to actively take them together and shape them for our better use. Because God is working. And he is working when we don't see him, when it seems hopeless, even when it seems like the good news and hope is still so far away. We are told that God is working in every area of our life. But what is God working towards? Simple. Last point. God is committed to our good. Romans 8.28 says in entirety, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So Paul keeps writing in this verse. We've been waiting with hope. God has been working. And now we find out what God's working towards. The good of those who love him. Because God is committed to our good. That's a big deal. God being committed to our good. Because it means that we are loved and valued by God. We are not a means to an end. We are not an asset to God. God does not use us. He doesn't value us based on our achievements. In reality, when we come to God, we bring nothing of our achievements, our works. Instead, we just bring our soul saying, God, will you take us into a relationship? Theologian Karl Barth said it like this, that the love of God contrasted with the questionable news of our life is its deepest reality. God's love stands against all the wrongs we have done and ever will do and says, I am committed to your good. God wants us, and he is committed to our good. But notice something in that. God does not say he is committed to our happiness. God does not say he is committed to our success. God does not say he is committed to our wealth. God is committed to our good, though. And the good he is talking about is so much more deeper and so much more significant than things that will pass away. God is committed to our redemption, The good that we are told that God is committed to is engaging with us in this relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we come to God thinking that God is committed to increasing our bank accounts, giving us a beach house, or making sure we age perfectly, you know, like the George Clooney type of treatment, we we miss out on the actual good that God is invested in. We miss out on something big. We miss out on Jesus because Jesus is the good. And this is so critical because if you're here and following Jesus, you need Jesus more. And if you're exploring who Jesus is today, one, we're so happy that you're here. But what you need is Jesus. Because God is working the redemption of the entire world and our beings. And that means that God is working to redeem all that has happened to us so we can be drawn closer to him. A pastor named Craig Barnes wrote it like this. That if we give our lives over to God, he could use our past, our failures, and the time we spent chasing dreams that did not work out. That is what it means to have a savior. Nothing is wasted. Because God is taking all things that have occurred and is using them for our good. God is taking all of our experiences and everything that we have to draw us close to God. But there's one caveat. God is only doing this for those who love him. God is only able to bring about redemption for those who are following after him. God is only able to bring about the good for those who are deeply in love with him. Because you cannot experience the realities of what Paul is talking about here apart from knowing and loving Jesus. And you might say, Adam, that sounds really harsh. That sounds exclusive. And I'd say it absolutely is not. Because if you're not following after Jesus, if you have rebuffed God, if you have rejected God, you wouldn't want what God's offering. Because he's not offering more money, a better family life, more vacation time. 
God is offering you Jesus and redemption. That is God's package for your life. And you will only enjoy that good if you are saying yes to Jesus. Because only those who are in love with God will want what God offers. And if you're exploring Jesus today, let me tell you the hope and life that Jesus offers. It's the redemption that our hearts long for. It's the discontent that our hearts point us towards. It's the answer to promise to every yearning and ambition that we have. And isn't that what our hearts long for today? We long for a purpose and meaning. We long for a bigger story that ties our story together. And we are ultimately looking for the good life. We are looking for the assurance that God is working for our good in all circumstances. And today as we close, it reminds me of one of the greatest stories in the Bible. It's the story of Joseph. It's from the book of Genesis, kind of this Bible book that starts with all the major stories of faith. And in Joseph's story, he starts off as a really young man. He was dad's favorite out of 11 kids, so a lot of competition there was kind of pointed. And his brothers hated him because of this. In fact, they despised him so much, they didn't just give him noogies. They actually sold him into slavery and faked his death. They really hated him. So a few years later on, Joseph's a slave in prison in Egypt. He was mistreated for years. But one day he had a chance to help the king. See, Joseph had this gift from God. It was the ability to interpret dreams. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, heard about this, and he had had a nightmare the night before. He had felt something was off. He didn't know what it meant. Nobody was able to kind of prepare him for it. So they heard about Joseph, and they called him out of the prison. Hey, tell us what this means. And Joseph interprets the dream. He says, Pharaoh, right now you're going to have a few years of plenty, but soon enough there's going to be a great famine that rocks your world. You need to prepare right here right now for what's coming ahead. Hire somebody to take care of this project for you. Give your attention to it. And Pharaoh looks and says, well, congrats, you've got the job. If you can interpret the dream, you've got the position. So Joseph prepares the nation, and Egypt goes through a massive famine, the whole world around them as well. And in the process of this, Joseph's brothers, who don't live all that far away, come to Egypt. They need to get some food from Joseph. And they come, and Joseph recognizes them, but he, they don't recognize him. He looks very different at this point in his life. And there's some family drama, but eventually he reveals who he is to his brothers. And they celebrate. They bring Joseph's father, Jacob, who's a very old man. They bring him to Egypt, and they have years of joy together. But eventually Jacob dies. And Joseph's brothers get very nervous because they wonder, have you only been kind to us because dad has been around? Is now the time for vengeance? And they come to Joseph kind of begging for mercy. But Joseph, looking back on his life, is able to see God's redemptive hand in things that were evil. He says in Genesis chapter 50 to his brothers, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph looked back on his life and saw all that had happened to him had been repurposed by God for good. It was for the saving of life. It was for hope. How God could take the evil things that had happened to a person and redeem them and use them for something more because God works for our good and the good that God is working for is our redemption. And today, can we stand together as we close? Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. This verse, it assures us, it challenges us. It assures us that God is working for us. But it challenges us to dive deeper, to look to God's purposes, to expand our view on life. It challenges us to have a kingdom orientation and trust that God will use everything in our lives for his purposes, to lead us to the good, to lead us to Jesus. And that's not easy. I know we live in a chaotic world. It's a hard place to understand all the things that are going on. But when we come to Jesus, we could trust that our lives, everything is being redeemed by God for his purposes. It's not easy to trust. So many things around us in the world tell us not to trust. Failed relationships, bad jobs, the chaos of life. But instead, we see something different with Jesus. He invites us into this relationship that gives us a chance to trust and be rooted in him. A ch chance to trust in a relationship where he will always be present. To trust that he isn't trying to get anything out of us. He just wants you. To trust that he could bring beauty and good out of the chaos of life. But mostly, 
to trust that Jesus is good. And that if we follow him, he will begin to intentionally bring our lives into a deeper and deeper relationship with him. And today, in a moment, we'll close in worship. I want to invite us to that simple act of trusting God. Of trusting God that he is working for you despite all circumstances. Trusting that God is working for your good even when you've been stuck waiting. Trusting that God is working in all situations for our good. Because when we identify with that trust, when we say, Jesus, at the core of our lives, at our identity, is this trust that you are moving, that you have a plan, that you have not forgotten us, and that we are with you, we aren't shaken. And today, as we close, if you need to trust that God is working for you, to keep on pressing, to say, God, despite all things, I'm believing for you, we're inviting you to make this altar a place of worship today. As our teams lead us, can we simply say, God, at this altar, we are saying we will continue to trust you despite everything. We will trust and believe you for more. Let's pray and worship today. Because your name is power. Your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadow, burn like a fire. Cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name many places where we're asking God to be faithful, to show that he is good. And today, can we corporately, if you have an area where you are just saying, God, I'm trusting that you will work this for good, could we raise our hands together and say, God, we're giving this to you. Oh, Lord, Holy Spirit, you see our hearts and our lives in our church today. Whether somebody is far along their faith or just exploring, God, you know the hurts, you know the bruises of our life, you know the reality and the struggles that we face. But God, we ask right here, right now, that you work for our good. God, we ask that you bring beauty out of the ashes, that you bring life from death. And God, we pray right now that you do something great in these lives. But more than anything, Jesus, we just simply ask that you speak to our lives, that you show us the good. God, help us to be fixated, to keep our eyes just focused on the promise of you, and that is Jesus, the redemption, the healing of our souls. God, let us not be distracted by the things to the left or to the right, but help us to focus on who you are, your son, the savior of the world, who not only could save our lives, but could save the world around us. God, we just ask that you heal us, that you keep working on us, that you do more than what we can ask, think, or imagine. We trust this to you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Pastor John. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Adam. <clears throat> Amen. What a great word. Trusting God, especially in the difficult things in our life. God, how are you going to take this and use it for good? Or maybe you're waiting on the Lord. You, you, maybe you're standing on a promise and it hasn't happened yet. Keep being faithful. Keep trusting. He has a way of taking care of even the difficult things in our life. Don't we serve a great God? Oh, he's so good. I, I, was, I felt encouraged. You know, I, 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 you know, COVID's been real. I was, I, I was at Wawa this morning. I saw that in Philly. I think one-fifth of the workforce, all the government workers, police, fire, people that work in public service have left. And people are trying to figure out life and just how does this all work out? But God says he works it out. And if we'll obey him and trust him, he can make our lives better, give us a testimony. He can give us an opportunity to serve, minister in ways we never thought before. Pastor Adam, thank you for a great word. Be part of our identity crisis, who we are in Christ. Amen. Amen. 
This message obviously we preach at 1045 and very similar at 4 o'clock today. Keep praying that God would touch people's lives. Next steps really quickly and then we'll pray. Baptism class is tomorrow. You need to sign up on the app or the website. Do that today. Membership class, if you're interested in being an official church member, there's responsibilities and privileges with that. But that's on this Wednesday. And then Sizzling Summer Bash, Saturday, July 22nd. And baptism will be at the Sizzling Summer Bash. So think about those things, but you need to sign up. Let me pray God's blessing on your life. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord bless you. I've been on vacation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. Hey, thanks for being in church. You've just watched through several weeks worth of filming. Thanks for being here today. We can't wait to see you at Marlton or at Valesburg. Make your choices. Bye now.